Jesus. <laughs> Good choice of words. After what he said about me, I mean, um, I hope I can live up to what he said. <laughs> you have in the film already, <laughs> which many people are about to see, yes. Yes, well, I hope so. Uh, but it was really... Uh, oh, yes, I forget that. Yes, I thought I hope this up. Yes. Um, yes. But I feel I want to talk to you. Yeah, well, you can hear me, can't you? Can you hear me? Um, so here I am. Uh, when I came to um, America first, it was how many years ago? You probably know more than I do. I think it was uh, 1945 when I came to um, Hollywood. And here I am. I haven't been here since then. And now, what year is it? I left, yes, I left in 1950. And I haven't been back since. But it's still lovely to be here. <laughs> and this was the last picture that you made in the United States, right? This was the last one I made here. Yes, in, in, um, yes, in America. Now, I have to ask, just a, how many people in the audience have seen Gun Crazy? Just <laughs> Now, how many of you are seeing this for the first time? Oh, this is good. It's like a half and half. This is perfect. That's exactly what I told you, Maggie, yes, that it was going to be half and half. Exactly. Because it's such a long time ago, you know, that, um, uh, well, I hope it will stand up to it. I think it does, maybe. Yeah, well, okay. my friend seems to think so, my dear friend, Eddie. I think you were a little ahead of your time in this movie, Peggy, so yes, the, there's no question that it's going to stand up. Uh, well, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Peggy's story, uh, discovered, really brought to this country by Daryl Zanuck. Yes, I had a contract with, with the 20th Century Fox, and I was a girl uh, who came over to play Forever Amber, and um, I didn't, because they didn't think I was sexy enough, <laughs> maybe, so I don't know if that was, uh, no, it was, I also, I think, was too young. But you may not even remember all about Forever Amber. I don't know if you do. You remember, you remember, yes, yes. So it's great to be back um, after that time. And of course, now we go to gun crazy. Well, and I have to ask, now, it's funny, if, we're doing this at the top of the film. Those of you who haven't seen the movie yet, we're not going to spoil anything about what's in the film. But you did come over here, and there was great fanfare when you came here. And I was telling you that I have photographs of some of that. Here's Peggy at her first American ball game, and here's Peggy dancing it with a combo. And, and there was such a splash made about your appearance here. And, and Fox really did a big build up. Yes, they did. Uh, yes, they did indeed. Does it amaze you or surprise you that the film that you would be most known for is this independently produced, and we, I think it's mistakenly called a B picture, but that this is the film that has survived? Well, it is extraordinary, really, because I have made um, a film with Ronald Coleman playing, I was playing his daughter, with Edward G. Robinson, I was playing his daughter, and I did a lovely one I called Moss, Moss, Moss Rose with Vic Mature, who was, I was very fond of, and Vincent Price, and Ethel Barrymore, and that's quite, you know, a name to stand up to. Um, and yet this gun crazy is the one that stood out more than anything else. And you know, it is quite extraordinary. And, when, and you told me a very funny story when you first came to Hollywood. Uh, you were so young, you were like 18 years old. Yeah, I'll tell you something, I weighed 98 pounds and I had an 18 inch waist. <laughs> but I'm not going to stand up and show you now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you said when you went to the first uh, party, one of Zanuck's parties. Yes, yes. Um, and you know, um, I. I loved watching films and uh, you so when i came and went into this room and all these people were here like uh, diamond power and lubitsch and um, john crawford and, and i walked in and before i was introduced i sort of saw them all and i said 
Oh, hello, as if I knew them. But I'd known them on the screen, you know, from seeing them on, in pictures. So it was, it was quite awesome, really, to come into that. They were all, and they were really stars, the ones I met, really stars. I was an actress, but they were stars, if you know what I mean. And I, and I just have to ask you to tell quickly the story of, uh, of one of those very eccentric men who uh, showed up at your house. Uh, yes, uh, Howard Hughes. Um, <laughs> uh, well, now, I'll have to try and put this straight and I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I was at a dinner party and uh, in those days you might go back to friends' houses and have a drink and he did came back with all the pe friends of her about eight people, and uh, he was standing in a corner, and my mother said to him, my mother was with me when I came to America, and she said to him, you're a long hank of destruction. Well, that, that was an Irish expression. But of course, he was deaf, so he never heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the interesting thing was, I was, um, um, he was, taking his aeroplane out, the one he made or the one he created. I'm not sure which, I think he created it. I don't know, do you, do you remember that incident when he? No, not the Spruce Goose. No. The one he crashed. Yeah, and he said to me, um, would I come out to dinner maybe sometime? He said, by the way, I'm gonna fly over your house. Uh, so I thought I was looking at every aeroplane, but, <laughs> but uh, sadly, of course, that plane crashed, and he was very lucky to come up, you know, to end up and be all right. It was a terrible crash. How they get him out, got him out, I don't know. But uh, so I never saw him again, actually, and so I was always had been out with him, but I never had. <laughs> so that was the end of the story. <laughs> Why in the world did the King brothers think that you, 98 pounds, <laughs> yes. and with an accent, yes. why did they have the, who had the vision to cast you as Annie Starr in this movie, which is the most ferocious female performance <laughs> in American cinema? Uh, you tell me. <laughs> Um, anyway, I was very lucky, wasn't I? You definitely were, yeah. and, and you did not think that this was, I mean, you weren't disappointed in doing a film like this after being no, in the no, Heights. No, no, you don't, I mean, um, I loved the idea, having read the script, I loved the idea of it, because uh, the tendency was, then, if you're sort of a um, bit short and blonde, all right, and, uh, reasonably pretty. Um, you were always playing rather pretty, pretty little parts. But this was a meaty part. Because really, to tell you the truth, I always wanted to play all the Betty Davis parts. <laughs> <laughs> and I was never offered one. <laughs> she was too good. But, the, you know, this was quite a meaty part. So an actor is always so thrilled to get a chance to play against what their character may be or the sort of person they are. Do you have a ferocious streak in you, Peggy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering. <laughs> I hope not. Um, no, I, I haven't. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's an incredible acting. <laughs> now, did, did you know, I don't suppose you did, um, that this script was actually written by Dalton Trumbo? At the time, I did not know. And I think it's, I mean, he was a, a great, he really was a very good writer. And of course, it was Kirk Douglas who gave him his credit uh, when he did, what film did he do? Spartacus, yes. And, and right. for those of you who don't know, I mean, Dalton Trumbo at, at this time was just about the highest paid screenwriter in Hollywood, but he was uh, one of the Hollywood Ten and uh, was suffering under the blacklist. And, and um, the King brothers, who were very savvy, opportunistic, independent film producers, realized that they could suddenly get Dalton Trumbo to write a script 
much more cheaply than he normally would because he was going to jail. He was going to jail. That's terrible. That's terrible. And, uh, and, and Dalton Trimbo, to his credit, always said, you know, people say, did you feel you were being exploited by the King brothers? And he said, no, absolutely not. They were the only ones in Hollywood that would pay me. Yeah. So I was happy to get the work because I needed to pay, you know, give money to my wife and children when I was going off to jail. And how, you know, how important it is. Uh, I'm here, yes, and I played this part, which was a great part for me. And you were really so dependent upon the writer, the director, uh, the cameraman. It's not me, it's everybody around you who helps you to create the part. Now, will John Dor, who played this, was he played in Rope. I don't remember if you, if you remember that one. And, you know, he was a very good actor. He died too young, really. Uh, he was a very good actor indeed. And, of course, he was so good, he made me look good. And this is what acting is a lot of, a lot about it is when you're working with somebody else, how they can improve you in a way or bring out the best part. But I mean, the writers, uh, the director, and not, not only the costume designer, the sets, all these things all make up a film. And it's essential to have them. And that's what makes great film. And did you feel when you were making this film that it, did you sense that something special may have been happening? Because there are certainly sequences in this film that were extremely unusual for the time. Yes. And, and we need to give credit to Joseph H. Lewis, who directs this film yes. so brilliantly. Absolutely. He, he was. No, I didn't. Well, you're making the film, I think you do, you're doing your best. You think it's going to be all, all right. You don't have great expectations about it. You know, you don't think it's going to be a, well, I never thought it was going to be like this one, and I'd be here 50 or 60 years afterwards talking to my friends here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what is, is amazing. So I didn't, I didn't, you don't think about it, I don't think. Now, I, I don't want to spoil this for those who haven't seen it, so we're going to talk around a few things in this film. But this film is very, very famous for one particular sequence. Uh, the bank robbery yes, scene, yes, which, uh, yeah. which is unlike anything else that was shot at the time. And can you just tell us about how that was done? Well, they, Joseph Lewis and the uh, cameraman and the sound. That's and Russ Meddy. Russell Meddy was the Russell, cameraman. Yes. Yeah. And the sound. And they, um, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll have to, uh, well, I'll have to. I can't, anyway. Um, <laughs> they d designed a car, and uh, I was driving the car. John Dorr was sitting beside me, and behind me, not unbeknownst to me, was the camera, the crew, the sound, really breathing down my neck. And they were all sort of terrified because I was driving this car. They were, you know. but anyway, they did. And <laughs> we had to drive, I, Joseph Lowe said, now look, you've got to get into this place where you park the car, get out, and, no, I don't get out, of course, I'm driving the car. John Dorr gets out, and you've got to make your own dialogue. And I don't think in the street uh, where the bank was, many people were aware of what was happening. So John Dorr got out of the car, and with that, a uh, policeman walks up along the side by me, and I thought this really, you know, he's in the bank, and I'm, I get out of the car, and I say, hello, <laughs> and he looks at me and he says, hello, what are you doing here? I said, I'm waiting for somebody. I was trying to think what I was going to say, and I said, I'm just waiting for somebody, oh yeah. Said, it's a nice gun you've got, and I said, uh, Oh, yes, yes, I'm playing it all very cool, but uh, shaking inside. And a few minutes later, or seconds, all hell breaks loose. Because the gun, the uh, John Dorr rushes out of the bank, and of course, the alarms go off, and he jumps in the car. And then we made again some dialogue between us, 
which wasn't ever scripted, and then we drove off. That was it. Which is about, it ran for about how many minutes? Oh, it's like I'm not sure. Four Maybe you can count it. It's, a, it's a single take, and it's just one absolutely take. spectacular. And we could really, yes, we could only do the one take, I think. I think it was only one take. Well, that's what I was going yes. to ask, yeah. because when you told me that you had improvised the dialogue, it made perfect sense to me that you would have improvised, because you don't want to miss a line and then say, oh, I blew it. Yes. It's like, you are driving safe at 70 miles an hour down the street. It's like, we don't want to do this again. No, exactly. <laughs> but it was, it, well, I hope you, well, you'll see it. I hope you'll realize that it, it was quite something in, in those days to do a take like that, wasn't it? Absolutely. And, and there are moments in this film that are just so stunning. Well, you just make me feel, I can't tell you. You think, you know, you think it was, it, well, I hope you like it. <laughs> you do realize how incredibly influential this movie is and that there's not a filmmaker working anywhere in the world today that is not a devotee of this movie. If you, if you ask anyone, from Martin Scorsese on down, everyone swears by Gun Crazy. It, it, they say that is the film that just knocks you out every time. When you see this as a kid, it's like, I want to do that. I want to make, I don't want to rob banks. I want to <laughs> make films like that. You know, and you're a big part of it, Peggy. I mean, it is really an extraordinary performance. Did... <laughs> did, but I have to add, did you know when you were doing this how much sexual symbolism is in this movie? I mean, the scene where you and John Dahl meet at the carnival, I call it, I call it, you know, foreplay as a director, is he very much encouraging you to like, you're feral. That's what it is. You're feral in this movie. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think. Yes, he was. But it, he was a very good director because he didn't implant.